Hey, Dane, did you know they're doing a new thing in baseball? What's that? They're, they're going back on your previous at-bats. And then they're counting balls that were actually strikes. They're counting them against you now. Mm. It's going to speed up the game a lot. So not, we don't even have to play the next season. We'll just skip the next season and go into the next 2025. That sounds a lot like what happened to us. A little bit. Do you think baseball, or they're getting their rule changes from what is happening over on YouTube? I mean, you might as well just keep playing the game of fantasy land. Yeah. And just rewrite the rule books to whatever you see fit, right? Yeah. So if you're wondering what David and I are talking about, we're not going to rehash because we talked about it for like 10 minutes on episode 119 about how we got nuked on YouTube and we need to be more careful over there and we're not going to post, you know, potentially bannable content over there and that, you know, you're part of our sane space and all that kind of stuff. Go listen to 119 if you want to hear the whole spiel. But just to let you know, keep you updated about where we are, we got our second YouTube strike this week, but as David's baseball analogy alludes to, it was a retroactive strike because they reached all the way back to January of this year to episode 78 to give us our second YouTube strike, uh, which I don't think retroactives are as bad as prospective because if if, the, if it was, our YouTube page would be completely nuked. Like, you wouldn't be able to find it. But you can. So, <clears throat> I don't know where we're, we're at with glad YouTube. We're just do we get any more? <laughs> do we get any more listeners after that? Like any more I, views on these? I know the bastards could at least have the common decency to hit subscribe. While yeah, no there. shit. <laughs> like and subscribe. Smash that like button. So anyway, share now, with your friends and family. I know your interests are peaked if you're a relatively new listener and you weren't here in January of 2022, and you're like, man, they're even getting retro banned. Uh, so episode 78, you can get it on any platform still, except for YouTube, apparently. And um, the title of the episode, David and I discussed this, I'm not going to say the word, but is, is uh, C-Word Cultists versus Squirrel <laughs> Turds, which is nuttier. I like it. I do too. I think it was I hilarious. Thought it was, I thought it was clever. I thought it was little hilarious. cutting, but not too much. So, you know. Um, I'll let you read the description under the video or wherever you listen to it at or over on our website at wmdpodcast.com backslash 78. Um, and then you can see if you want to click play on the whole episode. I think it's funny. I remember what we talked about in that episode. I think it was good and informative. And I couldn't. Regardless, you can hold a gun to my head. I regardless of what the overlords anything. had to say. So anyway, we got that strike and we got another woo strike on YouTube. We're really, really We're closing it on 4.0 in real We're, time. Sorry, I just said YouTube, not YouTube. Another strike on oh. TikTok. This is now, if you're keeping track, we are on our... Fourth page. I think it's, it's the fourth this or third. third. I know it's called 3.0, but, but it might be our fourth because the first one, I don't remember. <laughs> it, the third or fourth TikTok page. Uh, the name of it is WMD Podcast underscore 3.0. It's so hard to keep And up. I didn't even see the clip. Who, they don't even tell us anymore what they're banning us or striking us for. They could just look um, like our fucking faces. <laughs> like, delete. So anyway, we got another one over there. That TikTok page is still up. So keep going over there to follow that if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, this is why we always stress, and then I'm going to let David get us into the show, is why we always stress, you have to follow us. If you like what we're doing here, what our mission, what our goal is, you have to follow us on as many platforms as you can. Even if you never watch us over on Odyssey, you have to follow us there because one day you might wake up and your YouTube that you, version that you're used to seeing us on just ain't going to be there. So follow us on all the platforms, but most importantly of all, go to wmdpodcast.com right on the homepage, click, you know, subscribe or join. I forget what the button says to join our email list, because if we get actually nuked off of every platform simultaneously with a Thanos snap of the fingers, you, we will always have that email list to be able to send you an email and say, hey, we got nuked off all these platforms. Here's our new name. We're on platform X, Y, or Z. Come follow us there. That we will never lose contact with you because we own that list. So uh, so join there if you're worried about losing your two smiling co-hosts at some point in the future. And with that, strike stuff's out of the way. David, I'm going to let you take it away. Well, it's all that cheery shit out of the way. I was thinking that we could, you know, for the culture quarter, discuss how we are the redheaded stepchildren, uh, we being the Libertarian Party. 
the redheaded stepchildren that always get blamed for everything, even though our party doesn't exist. They tell you that you can't vote for us because it's throwing away your vote. But every time somebody loses, they blame you because all the people that voted for you should have voted for their candidate, as if that even makes sense. Anywho, and this is a not a slight to either redheads or redheads that happen to be stepchildren. It's just a it's just gingers are gross. It's just just you clean it up. <laughs> you and your freckles, clean it up. Epstein didn't kill himself. Fetterman versus Oz in the land of Oz, the snake oil peddler versus the. And I'm not saying this to be disparaging. This is actual fact. The stroke victim. Who comes out on top? Let's find out. Well, later. he's also a bit of a snake world peddler. Well, you, uh, yeah. hey, he's a he's a shill. Metaphorically, he's speaking. a shill. We'll call him a shill. And then the main topic: the red wave turned into the red trickle. What the fuck happened there? We got thoughts. All you had to do: walk into the end zone. Fucked it up. Couldn't do it. Anyway, you want to jump in, Dane? I think we should. Welcome to Weapons of Meme Destruction Podcast, episode 120, which can be found at wmdpodcast.com backslash 120. You can get the audio only on any podcast catcher. Just search Weapons of Meme Destruction. You can get the video on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and Float. I believe, looking at our show notes page, this one is safe for YouTube. So yes, this one will also be on YouTube. We think. We think. Who knows? Um, and then you can also link up with us on our non-podcast related pages, but still a part of the larger sane space where you can join the conversation <laughs> with us on anything we're talking about over on Instagram, TikTok for now, and also Twitter. Oh, and we are also on Tribal. Remember that from a couple episodes ago, T-R-I-B-E-L, the leftist Twitter version that everybody's you know, abandoning ship on Twitter. All the blue checks are abandoning ship on Twitter. It's not safe there. for them anymore. There's other ideas out there. <laughs> if you'll remember, we had the funny idea to try to get banned from there faster than the Libs of TikTok account got banned, which was within 20 minutes of signing up. But our video guy, always the stubborn contrarian that he is, decided that he wanted the to try, contrarian. that he wanted to try to stick around on there and try to persuade some of these <laughs> super reasonable people that arrive at all of their conclusions through logic and reason and not through blind emotion. Um, he wanted to stick around over there and try to see if he could win some hearts and minds. God bless him if he does. Uh, we're not poo-pooing his dreams. We're just saying they're not Highly likely. You know what? But Ever so for now, we're, the, the takeaway is we are still over at Tribal. So if you want to wade into that particular cesspool, you'll find us there. We're peeing in the shallow end. Dane, I want to start off with a quick callback <laughs> to episode 119 and note that your water bottle is not secured. I thusly, I know. thusly, but it's making not the whole to... point of the cap, the screw on cap, superfluous. Okay, but. I just noticed the first time I unscrewed it, it's like I'm unscrewing it and I could hear, I that's could the, hear it. I know it's going to be hot. In the, you, know what? you know what? It's not sacrificed? A $15,000 computer. Yeah, it's not. It don't, was don't let the people think that we actually have money. $15,000. We have no money. We don't have We're no money. We're totally money. <laughs> um, So anyway, uh, yeah, with that being said, David, are we, we are in the culture good. corner with the libertarians being their redheaded stepchilds of the political realm. So we talked about this during the 2020 election uh, because, of course, every time either side went... Here's the thing. The first thing that should tell you that your argument is bullshit is when the other side that is apparently diametrically opposed to you, you're, you're not really, but that's what the left and the right thinks of each other is when the other side has the exact same argument for the exact same reasons, one of you, and I would 
posit to you, both of you, are absolutely full of shit. That should, your, your, your flag should just perk up when you're like, well, the other side makes the same argument. And that argument is, when one of the big two loses, they blame the Libertarians, especially if the amount of votes that the Libertarian candidate got was within the margin of victory between the two sides. And um, I mean, that's just a stupid emotional argument and I can prove it to you. You know how I can prove it to you without even thinking about it? They assume that all of those votes would have gone to their party. That's exactly right. Yep. It's like, okay, I was, if I'm a dyed in the wool fucking Democrat, but I just don't agree with most of the shit that they're saying, yeah. right now, the, the, lesser of two evils as to vote for my complete antithesis. I just vote libertarian and just kind of opt out of whatever the hell's going on. But if you're going to force my hand and I'm, you're literally forcing me out of the party, I'd only have one other option and that'd be Republican or not vote. So there's still another option. So, and then not to mention the fact that Everybody that ever says anything to you about the Libertarian Party before or after or during an election campaign is that you're throwing away your vote. You're throwing away your vote. Like, I'm sorry. Is my vote not my voice in this country? I, I'm sorry. If I don't agree with you on the left and I don't agree with you on the right, what else can I do other than vote for somebody down the middle? I mean, that just seems logical to me, Dane, but logic need not apply in election cycles. Logic need not apply in how my country is supposed to be run. It's supposed to be the all holy left or the insidious vindicated right. I don't know which, and yeah, I, I'm aware. I, I did it stage right, stage left for you, but I, I, I'm aware that within myself, I went right when I said left and then left when I said right. If that makes any sense for you. Right. Um, so, yes. So, let me give you a concrete example for why this is utter bullshit. And again, the reason why it is just an emotional crybaby throwing a temper tantrum appeal from either side because they put forth a shitty candidate that couldn't capture our votes. Again, not our fault. Um, the real world example is the uh, Warnock versus Walker Senate race in Georgia, which, as you may know, is in a runoff because neither one of them got to uh, 50%, which is you have to get to at least 50% for the, the winner to be declared. Now, the vote difference between those two was 30,000 votes and the Libertarian candidate got 80,000. So the Libertarian candidate theoretically got the margin spread of victory between those two major party candidates. The reason why this line of logic is complete and utter bullshit is because it's founded on a bullshit premise. And that bullshit premise is, had there not been a libertarian candidate, the libertarians would have voted as a block in one way or the other, either all for Republicans or all for Democrats. And the reason why that's bullshit is for a couple of things. First of all, it completely forgets the fact that many libertarian voters probably just won't vote at all. So, the, if they're not voting at all, then they're not voting for your candidate to be able to make up that margin difference. The other thing is when you look at independent voters as a whole, so not just libertarians, but let's just lump libertarians in with independent voters, right? Independents are usually pretty evenly spread depending on the state, you know, 50-50 one way or another. You know, maybe one side gets 55 and 45 and that's the difference in the election. But let's just use the Warnock, Walker, and then um, the Libertarian candidate as an example. So 80,000 votes, right? If it's 50-50, they cancel each other out, Warnock still wins, okay? Let's say it's 60-40, and let's say um, instead of uh, 40 and 40 for each side, uh, Walker gets 50 and Warnock gets 30. Well, he still had a 30,000 vote lead, so he still wins by 10,000 votes. So that doesn't change the outcome. Let's step it up a little bit more and say Walker gets three quarters of the libertarian vote. Again, hardly any independents as a block vote 75% for one side or the other. And let's say he gets 60,000 votes. Well, that still means that 20,000 went to uh, Warnock, which means that Walker now wins the election by 10,000 votes. So you're telling me 
that Walker needs to get 75% of the libertarian votes, never going to happen for any candidate, is going to get 75% of one voting block, and that would have been the difference in the election. And you're going to pay, you're going to put all of the weight of your candidate losing um, on those 80,000 votes not going his way, and that you should have, yet you were somehow entitled to 75% of them. Again, you have a shitty candidate, and speaking to Republicans in particular, you always talk about how libertarians are too extreme or Ron Paul was a kook and all that kind of stuff. Well, you always dismiss us and then you wonder why we don't vote for your candidate. Make it make sense. And for Democrats, the democracy is sacred side. Um, did I miss the point where every vote counts and vote your conscience and all of that kind of stuff? Or wait, is it only democracy is sacred when you're you know, morally bankrupt, mentally deficient uh, candidate wins. Maybe that's the only time democracy is sacred. Well, Dane, we but saved democracy with the red tide being avoided. Yeah. They showed that democracy upheld. Um, and there wasn't any Russians. Anywho, speaking of two shitty options, you want to move into the Epstein portion of this conversation where we have Fetterman versus Oz. Oz, who's a daytime TV celebrity that tells you about the latest and greatest on how to lose body fat because that's apparently the only thing that has anything to do with housewives that are watching the TV at that time. He'll just tell you a bunch of different things that is going to lose body fat. Or Fetterman, a shittier version of a Shrek, a Biden. Of a Shrek <laughs> character with a possibly shittier goatee to go along with it. Oddly enough, we thought that Biden may have been an apparition in terms of voters electing somebody who can't form a coherent sentence, but I think he was just paving the way for a Fetterman because I'm pretty sure that Biden now looks coherent and together and with it compared to Here's the, the way Fetterman strings words together or we doesn't. used to elect, well, the concept was to elect our best and our brightest to lead this country. Now we have, what would you call it? Marketing, marketing specialists that say, oh, give him a break. He's just, he's struggling because he had a stroke six months ago. Like give, give him a chance, like let him read all the things and then he'll totally understand it. It's like, I'll give you a break as a stroke victim when you're, having trouble making your Starbucks order. I'll give you a break when the light turns green and you take an extra five seconds to start driving because you're a stroke victim. I'll give you a break at the movies when you shout out, he sees dead people in the middle of the six sets. I get it. You had a stroke. It's bad. It's bad. Spoiler alert, by the way, if you haven't seen The Sixth Sense, it's kind of you have you like now. 25 years. Yeah, get, get it's, it's not really a spoiler alert. <laughs> My point being is that I'll give you a break in those aspects. But when you're running for an elected office, which is supposed to represent the people that elect you within that given area, and you have to dictate <clears throat> legislature for their benefit, I can't give you a break when you come out with quotes as like, I like an eagle because you know what an eagle represents is it's, it's a better part of a representation of an eagle. It's not a direct Fetterman quote, but it's pretty close. You would, you would have to Google it to find out. <laughs> Put it that way. That's my only point. It's like, when are we going to start holding elected officials accountable or the parties that put them forward accountable for giving us two options of shit and choosing whether we want a red wrapping paper or a blue wrapping paper in front of it. That's all I'm saying. It's like, stop blaming people for voting for these people. Start blaming the party and holding them accountable. Start voting libertarian. Start voting for something that isn't the fucking binary bullshit they're forcing down your throat. That's all. I'm, I'm sorry, my rhetoric's gone. That's... Though. Th th that's fine as far as it goes, but I, I got to say, you know, the parties are going to do what the parties are going to do. I, at some point, the blame does have to fall on the voters because, again, 
if you are the voter who says, well, lesser, two, lesser of two evils, I got to do it. What in, Again, we always talk about human beings and incentives. What incentives are, are there for the parties to give you anything else? If you're going to vote for whatever, then they're going to put up whatever. So at, the, at, a, at, a, at a bare minimum, it's a two-way street. They're giving you shitty candidates because you keep voting for them. And you keep voting for them because you're just stuck in this lesser of two evils binary that you can't seem to get yourself out of. <laughs> you know what they do? They blame you for it. Oh, yeah. Well, it's always our... Uh, well, how dare you judge him for not being able to form a coating sentence? He has a stutter. He has a stutter, goddammit. Or he had a stroke six months ago. Give him a break. Like, then why is he up there? If he... If that's truly, truly the best candidate that you have, I obviously shouldn't vote for them because you have no answers for me. That's my whole point of that rhetoric. Right. But the point is that 2.7 million people decided not to do that. That's how Holy many people voted for, for Fetterman. In the and, and here's the thing. Here's the key takeaway. We've said this on many, many podcasts before. Every time we say it, we're like haters of mankind and freedom, justice, truth, and liberty, and whatever, is democracy is bullshit. It's an illusion. It doesn't work. And I can prove it to you empirically. Because 2.7 million people voted for Fetterman, and if anybody is looking at that objectively, I don't care if they're a Republican, I don't care if they're a Democrat, and I don't care if they're non-party affiliated, I don't care if they don't even live in this country. Anybody looking at that objectively, the man has literal, clinically diagnosed brain damage. Yes, as a result of a stroke, sympathy come and go as for whatever that's worth, but the point is, Medically speaking, it is an objective fact, not mocking him or anything else like that. It is a fact that the man has brain damage. And 2.7 million people watched his debate performances. They watched the way he strung or not they didn't. strung sentences honest, together. And they voted for him. Why? Because he wasn't endorsed by the Red Party. That is what democracy ultimately is. It is a popularity contest where you don't vote for the other guy or gal. And that's why it's broken. That's why it doesn't work. That's why it's never going to give you the outcomes that the high ideals of democracy say that it's worth. And, you know, that's just, it, it's baked into the system. It's not a bug. It's a feature. It is a feature of democracy that the lowest common denominator is going to choose the overlords that rule over all of you. So even if you choose to say, you know what, this whole system is, is just screwed over. I don't want to partake in it. I don't have any. Well, guess what? He's still writing, leg or not writing, his aides are writing legislation for you. Whether you chose to vote for him. Even if you don't live in his state. Kind of like you. Even if you don't live in his state. If you live in freaking BFE, Mississippi, and you are a million miles and 10 different socioeconomic statuses away from where John Fetterman is sitting up in his fancy office in DC, he's still writing policy for you. Why? Because 2.7 million people couldn't look at the facts and be like, yeah, I don't think this guy's fit for the office he's running for. I'm going to vote for him though, because I don't like Oz. He's got an R behind his name. That's an, that's, that is an irretrievably broken system and you're never going to get good outcomes out of it. If you're being honest with yourself, objective and reasonable, but you know, if you're just a, 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 a party hack, you know, just voting for your guy just because of what color they wear, as David says with the wrapping paper, we're not talking to you because you're, you're past the point of no return. We can't. But to those of you in the middle, the broad swath of people that are like, this system looks jacked, that's who we're talking to. All I'll say is I've heard the statement, democracy won a lot this week. And it's more partial to the, our last segment, which we're about to get to right now. But if this is democracy, it's not, it's not what we wrote. It's not what the forefathers wrote. This is not the idea that they had, that we'd have mentally disabled people running our government. And with that being said, Dane. Well, before we get into that, we just wanted to give you a couple examples, both oh. from opposite end of the spectrum. We're going to let you hear in their own words. Both of these were in. We got, we got tech. We're in presidential, primary elections, debates, 
uh, in 2008. We had Mike Gravel, who was a former Alaskan senator, a Democrat, on the stage with Hillary and Obama, you know, Democrats versus Democrats. And then the second clip we're going to play is the Ron Paul, Rudy Giuliani moment. And we want you to just, first of all, hear how these gentlemen articulate their points, first of all. And, uh, you know, at least showing at least co enough cognitive fortitude to be able to do the job that they're running for. But second of all, about how these two individuals were treated both within their own party and by the voting public at large based on the narratives that were created around them. First up is Mike Gravel, but, former Democratic senator running for president in 20, 2008. Before we do that, you have to take credit for killing one of the best segues I've ever had. What was that? I don't think you said it. Did you say it? I was segueing into the next topic, but I forgot that well, we you had can these segue quotes. after. Okay, Mike segue Gravel. this in your asshole. How about that? <laughs> Mike Gravel. Spin on it, too. First up. Here we go. Here we go. Senator Gravel, that's a weighty charge. Who on this stage exactly tonight uh, uh, worries you uh, so much? Well, I would say the top tier ones. The top tier ones. They I'm made statements. Oh, Joe, I'll include you, too. You have a certain arrogance. You want to you wanna tell the Iraqis how to run their country. I got to tell you, we should just play get out. Just play get out. It's their country. They're asking us to leave, and we insist on staying there. And why not get out? What harm is it going to do? Oh, the, you hear the statement, well, my God, the soldiers will have died in vain. The entire deaths of Vietnam died in vain. And they're dying in vain right this very second. You know what's worse than a soldier dying in vain? is more soldiers dying in vain. That's what's worse. So, I mean, you may not agree with this point, but cogently stated, and when you watch this clip, which you'll see on the For description the on this, and also at the at the the uh, website, wndpodcast.com backslash 120, you'll see, he points out, so in the middle, when he says the top ones, he's talking about Obama, <laughs> Hillary, and Joe Biden, uh, who were the main front runners at that point. And they're just laughing. They're just having a good old time laughing at, at his idea that maybe we shouldn't just throw more American soldiers into the meat grinder, the foreign policy quagmire, which, by the way, Democrats at that time were running on, this is Bush's war, this is terrible, we shouldn't do this, we should get out. And when he has the, the audacity to say exactly that, they just think it's hilarious. They just think the idea that they're of, all to, laughing to not have endless wars is just the funniest thing ever. So they're laughing. That that tells you about your uh, one of those people, by the way, ended the war. How did he end the war, by the way? Yeah, not not uh, not not efficiently or effectively, mm -hmm. and created a vacuum, and now it's worse. And then, all right. So the next and the the second clip before we move on to the main part of the episode is the Ron Paul Giuliani moment. Libertarians will already know what this is, but this is Ron Paul talking about the blowback that comes from being in other people's countries, and maybe they might not like that, and it might have some negative effects in your own country. I'm, I'm suggesting that we listen to the people who attacked us and the reason they did it. And they are delighted that we're over there because Osama bin Laden has said, I am glad you're over on our sand because we can target you so much easier. They have already now, since that time, have killed 3,400 of our men, and I don't think it was necessary. Wendell, may I make a comment on that? That's really an extraordinary statement. That's an extraordinary statement as someone who lived through the attack of September 11. That we invited the attack because we were attacking Iraq. I don't think I've ever heard that before, and I've heard some pretty absurd explanations for September 11. And I would, I would ask the congressman to withdraw that comment and tell us that he didn't really mean that. Congressman? I believe very sincerely that the that the CIA is correct when they teach and, and talk about blowback. When we went into uh, Iran in 1953 and installed the Shah, yes, there was blowback. 
uh, the reaction to that was the taking of our hostages. And that persists. And if we ignore that, we ignore that at our own risk. That If we think that we can do what we want around the world and not incite hatred, then we, then we have a problem. They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. I mean, what would we think if we were, uh, if other foreign countries were doing that to us? Again, maybe you don't agree with Ron Paul's point, but the point is cogently and well stated. And again, that the the way he was treated, both the the raucous applause for Giuliani while while Ron is just kind of well, laugh. Well, Ron got the the best of it in the end because yeah, it it did come out that that's, we were lied into that war and that the losses of life on both sides for us and innocent Iraqi civilians was not worth it. So, you know, drowning those voices out and kicking them out of your party and off the stage is exactly why you wind up with a Fetterman versus an Oz or a Warnock versus a Walker. And libertarians are in the middle saying, I am not voting for either one of these dipshits. It, the weird thing is this, this is like what I think is the formation of emotional voting, if I can say that, emotional reaction. Whenever you react, psychologically speaking, because that might be in a field of mind that I've studied, um, whenever you react based on emotion solely, usually it's the wrong reaction. You heard Giuliani, who then was a hero, by the way, because he was the mayor of uh, Manhattan. Was he the mayor or was he the governor of... New York. New York City. <clears throat> Mayor of New York Mayor, City. Mayor of New York City. And he oversaw the attacks on 9-11. So obviously, he was already viewed as a hero. And when he stood up and said what he did, all he had to say was 9-11. How dare you say? It's like that family guy quote. Yeah, 9-11. <laughs> oh my God, he's the best. It's like, okay, cool. That, that's fine. But aren't we missing the things that led up to 9-11, when you react emotionally, like when he saved us from 9-11 or when he got us back on board from 9-11, you're clapping, ah, 9-11. What happened? What happened because of 9-11? Or what caused 9-11? That is what actually matters. And that's what was Senator Paul was getting after. We Congressman. fucked... Congressman. Representative Paul. He was not wasn't a senator. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, anyway. His son is. That's where it, ah, Rand Paul is. Rand Paul. Yeah. He was a little young at the time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anywho, my whole point being is like when someone's pointing out the facts and figures and telling you what is and isn't good, but somebody just comes along and says one line and everyone gets on their back and says, like, yeah, Beth, like pull back from that. Because that's how you get Federan versus Oz. That's how you get... Uh, you can't vote for the third party because the third party will never win. Or that's how you get, you voted for the third party, well, you cost my candidate's election. Like, that's simple-minded thinking. That's how they want you to think. Like, think broadside. Think about how we got here. Because if you don't see how we got here, we'll never get out of where we're at now, which is plummeting towards annihilation, to be honest. Like, you save democracy because you, because the the Democratic Party didn't totally get landslided this election. That's that's not that's not anything to shout about. And the last thing I'll say is you get candidates like Fetterman because of what those videos showed, and they remind me of two quotes from the thespian of our times, Rick Sanchez from the animated uh, cartoon <laughs> Rick Rick and Morty is first of all, when you hear all that clapping for, for Giuliani, um, paraphrasing Rick when a similar thing happens to him, he says, your booze mean nothing to me because I've seen what makes you cheer. That's the first thing, is look at what the people adore, that sort of emotional you know, bullshit that, that Giuliani t tossed out there as red meat. And the last thing, <clears throat> the, last, the second quote from Sanchez, a different episode, is 
Morty's saying, you know, Rick, you know, you might be right, but nobody really likes it because, you know, you're just such an asshole with the way you say it. And Rick responds, again, I'm paraphrasing, with something to the effect of, yeah, well, that's why popular people are dumb because everybody wants people that they like to be right. And I mean, if that's not Fetterman to a T, and it's not even that, you know, the voters really necessarily liked him so much as they just really hated the other guy. He had a D. He had a D and the other guy had an R. Yeah. That's as far as they looked into it. And that's so sad. if if that's what your political system is based on, those are the candidates you're gonna get, you're gonna have a bad time. You're not gonna have great outcomes. It, things aren't gonna get any better. You're gonna be thirty trillion dollars in debt and you're gonna <laughs> be in endless pizza, wars and everything else. When you want a French fry, you're gonna have a bad time. If you're French fry where you're supposed to pizza, you're gonna have a bad time. And with bad times being had, Dane. The main topic of tonight, the red tide turned into a trickle. It was a trickle. Much like the hurricane that misses this week. hi <laughs> Much to the chagrin of the uh, red side of the political spectrum. Um, and we have, as we told you, we have some thoughts about why this happened. And, you know, we want to be ecumenical and we want to start with not pointing fingers at either side and just make a point about the system in addition to the ones that we've already made on this episode. Uh, the first being the nonpartisan critique that rational ignorance is a real thing. And we've talked about this on the podcast before, but for any new listeners or viewers, a little explanation about what rational ignorance is. It is not pointing fingers at anybody. It is stating a simple fact of life. When you are a voter, you have so many things demanding of your time. You have to get up and go to work every day to earn money, to keep a roof over your head and food on your table. If you have kids, you got soccer practice and PTA meetings and all of these other things that are taking your time and attention. You have to spend time with your spouse. You have to make time for your family and friends. You have to have hobbies. You have to have all of these things that contribute to make you a unique, wholesome, you know, fully well-rounded human being. And to be able to study up and learn about whatever your preferred candidate, uh, whatever their policy positions are on X, Y, or Z, you have to cut time out from those other aspects of your life to do that. Now, I posit to you, dear listener, that not very many voters actually do that. They spend a very tiny fraction of the amount of time that they would need to be able to have an expertise on all of the policy ranges and to, and to confound this even more when you vote for a Biden, a Fetterman, uh, anything else in between, you don't vote for them on one issue. Some people do. Some people say, oh, well, what's their stance on X? I'm going to vote for that. But you're getting a whole smorgasbord of policies. A Fetterman has a, a, an opinion on what the minimum wage should be, on what foreign policy should be, on whether we should have universal health care, what he thinks about student loan forgiveness, all of these disparate issues which require an expertise in and of themselves for you to have a reasonable, rational, objective opinion of if I vote for this person, is that actually in my own best interest? It's impossible. This is why it's called rational ignorance because these voters, they're not stupid in that sense. They are being rational and trying to vote for what they think is in their best interest, but they can't possibly know about everything they're expected to vote on and therefore they are ignorant of it. And because of that, you can't possibly have this high ideal thing for democracy that we're told that it is, is that, well, the people, you know, have their say and they, they get to pick who rules over them. And so that's why democracy is that great. Do you really? I, I posit to you, this is why Congress regularly has an approval rating in the single digits. It has a reelection rating above 95%. It's because of rational ignorance. We're not, quote unquote, voting the bums out. The incumbents stay by and large, and they keep doing the same thing that they're doing, which is against what the people actually want again and again, as polls suggest, and nothing ever changes. The system is broken. That system's not going to give you positive outcomes. So whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're going to be disappointed election after election. David, you awake now? Oh, are you done? Yeah. All right, I, I, I didn't know. Yeah. Because you basically went through all the things that we were about to go through. No, no, that was just the first point. Oh, oh boy. It's going to be an expensive episode. Anywho, um, we came up with a couple of keynotes before we jumped into the episode. And what we came up with is non 
partisan critique. That's the one I just did. How how much did they spend, Dane? Uh, 16 to 18 billion roughly was spent on these midterms, which is a record for money spent on midterms. Wow. Why, 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 why would they be so concerned about this particular yeah. midterm election? Well, I mean, it's also quite funny that, remember the whole rigmarole about Elon supposedly being a terrible person because he didn't spend $6 billion to solve world hunger. Well, I'd like to ask all of the people that donated 16 to 18 billion to political candidates, many of them which lost, right? How much money was given just to Beto and Stacey Abrams themselves? Mm -hmm. I could have taken a heavy bite out of world hunger, again, assuming it's solved with $6 billion. So again, wasted money, wasted outcomes. World ain't going to get any better. World <laughs> hunger ain't getting solved. So what are we doing here, folks? Is this really the best possible outcomes that we could, we could expect? Listen, the second point that we came up with Breaks my heart because I was just refining my. It's he's been great. He's been a wonderful candidate. I can't say anything wrong about him. I want to thank all my supporters. It's the biggest thing that's ever happened. Maybe, possibly, I don't know. That's what people are saying. Like I was just dialing it's one of my favorite I, lines of his. That's I was what just people, people are saying. It. I was just dialing in my Trump <laughs> imitation, but now apparently Trump is toxic. I think so. How's that? Well, it seemed that in the primaries, Trump was a bit of a kingmaker, right? Is if, if he endorsed you in the primary, chances were you were going to win and you were going to go to the general against whatever Democrat they ran against you. But I think after this election, when you see the juxtaposition of the way Trump endorsed candidates engaged in messaging versus... I'm not going to say Trump didn't endorse DeSantis. He had negative things to say right on the eve of the election. But DeSantis ran his campaign, and many Florida uh, people that ran for election down here ran it in a very different way. <laughs> they focused on, look what the other side did to you throughout COVID. They were anti-freedom. Here, we're pro-freedom. This is where freedom comes to live. That won in landslides. I think Trump beat Charlie Chris 60% to 40%. Trump? I'm sorry, DeSantis. Smoked them. But you had Trump candidates all over the country losing their elections, not the least of which was Oz or Kerry Lake for governor in Arizona. So I think the, the, the takeaway from this, if you're on the right side of the political spectrum, is you have to fix your messaging. Because as much as talking about um, election fraud and all that kind of stuff might be important, I'm not saying it's not. I am saying that that doesn't resonate with people outside of your base. And when you get into a general, you're going to, again, have a bad time. Maybe focus more on freedom and trying to expand that. That seems to resonate with people a hell of a lot more. Well, again, the last thing I'll say on this is that the thing that gives you a power eventually turns on you. And he can't help himself. Like, he will keep talking. He will keep being that rash, bravado. She's a disgusting person. I only had sex with her twice, and I said I couldn't do it anymore. She's disgusting. Biggest vagina I've ever seen. No big, no big deal. It's what people are saying on the streets. Anyway, so, like, he can't stop. So people are realizing that now what made him famous is also what's undoing him. So now people are starting to distance him. And maybe, just maybe, the left can also start letting go of the like adherence to blaming everything that's still happening on Donald Trump. Maybe, 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 just maybe, maybe. I don't know. Maybe we don't need any more stories on Donald Trump. Just, just a thought, careless thought. Um, the third point that we think that they might have fucked up, they being the Republicans, is that they went after the abortion issue. Well, they didn't, they didn't listen to us. Well, That's the problem. If they would have called. Yeah, I, I mean, my lines were open. Were, were, were yours? I mean, they, you're, you're more important than I am, but like, I know I'm more available you could have just CC'd me on the call yeah, and yeah. I, I'd have taken it from there. Yeah. But I understand 
that we had a better viewpoint of what they should have done with the abortion debate. Maybe it was ill-timed and ill-conceived. Yeah, no pun intended. Now, (laughs) here's, here's the point. Do with that conception what you want. Here's the point, and it kind of tacks on with the the Within second your state. The second point about messaging, right? If you remember a few episodes ago, um, I'll link to it in the in the show notes. I don't have it off the top of my head right now. But when the Dobbs decision came down, uh, we spent an entire podcast episode explaining to people that Dobbs was not this existential crisis to women's health care, and that it was a universal ban across the entire country on abortion. All it did was kick the decision about what to do with abortion down from the federal level to the individual states. Made it closer to your vote. Yeah, to give you you more individual control over it. And I think Republicans messed up twice. First, they didn't think that that was going to be as motivating of an issue as I think it was to get Democrats to the polls. That's the first thing they underestimated in that sense. And the second thing is, I didn't see any Republican candidates really trying to drive this point home, is that you now have more control at the state level. So if you want to protect it, if you want to outright ban it or whatever, you still have that control, especially if I'm a Senate, I'm, I'm a Senate or a, or a federal con- congressional member uh, or re- representative. If I'm running for those offices, this isn't in my wheelhouse. It, talk, talk to your state representatives. That's where it's at. And I'll give you some examples from this election, some, some amendment referendums in different states to kind of show you how Dobbs didn't, it wasn't this, you know, handmaid's tale type sea change that people needed to be all freaked out and like, oh, I need to go for vote for the senator in my state because I care about abortion. And that's my number one issue. If Republicans would have made the point that you still have that control at the state level, they would have muted that sort of existential crisis motivator for Democrats to turn out on that particular issue. So a couple examples. The state of Michigan, traditionally blue state, they voted to approve a constitutional amendment in their state constitution to a right to an abortion. Okay, that's a blue state. Kentucky, a reliably red state, voters rejected an anti-abortion amendment to their constitution. So they may not say, yeah, we want an absolute right to it, but we're also, we don't want you to say that you can't have it. Even in a red state like Kentucky, or even going so far as California and Vermont, both approved essentially limitless abortion in their state constitutions because theirs don't make any sort of viability exceptions, which was the framework under Roe. In California and Vermont, you now have more right, more access to abortion than you even did pre-Dobbs because you don't even have the row restrictions hanging over you anymore. And that's exactly what the point that we made on that episode is you're going to have a a, a buffet of choices in the 50 jurisdictions of the United States. Do I want a state that allows it all the way up until birth? Do I want a state that is somewhere in the middle? Or do I want a state that outright bans it? Well, according to these states, some blue, one red, uh, there is no absolute ban even at the state level. And if Republicans would have made that point a little bit stronger, they could have completely muted it in terms of its outpack. You know what? If they would have had Kate Upton in a fucking bikini eating a burger saying this this thing with like mayonnaise dribbling down her tits, this thing makes voting for abortion closer to home. (laughs) With her fucking juicy little, well, maybe not Kate Upton. Who's the, who's the viable candidate nowadays? No, you couldn't. Zendaya is not. I wouldn't. She's not that person. I I wouldn't get in the habit of referring to <laughs> women as viable or not viable, David. I think yeah, I would steer clear of that type of language. That there's more viable women. All right, Nancy Pelosi takes a bite <laughs> of a burger and mayonnaise dribbles down her tits. It, does that hit the same as like? Pick your favorite I, porn star. I don't I'm care. Don't you... Let's sexify this up. Let's get some eyes on it. And let's say that this isn't what they say it is. This is what we did. We made it more viable for you to vote on what you want to do with abortion. We cl- made it closer to home. But the Republicans are always so shitty at 
communicating whatever the fuck they want to do. And the Democrats are so like savvy because they own most, if not all, of media. So they know that they have Silicon Valley. They they have a young upstart young group that's going to spin this story to make it sound like it's it's better than what it is. The don't say gay bill. Nowhere in the don't say gay bill in Florida did it say don't say gay. It just said don't tell my kid that it's okay to suck a cock when he's six. <laughs> just a thought, a careless thought. Just don't make it feasible for him to be sitting in elementary school and say, hey, sometimes your girlfriend's going to want to peg you in the ass with a dildo. Like, what? <laughs> like, that's not... Teach him how to read. Teach him the ABCs. One, two, threes. It's easy as do, re, mi, fa, so, le, ti. ABC, one, two, three. Maybe yeah. you and me, girl. All I'm saying is that get out ahead of it Make sure that you know what your nomenclature is and then deliver the product. Republicans, you are fucking 1950s. You are my father's party before my father, my grandfather's party. Catch up if you want to be in here. Otherwise, the Democrats are going to keep telling you that women can be men and men can be women and a guy can push a baby out of his dick hole and vice versa. Anyhow, right. The fourth point that we came up with is that 25% of Gen Z came out and voted, and you might be shocked who they voted for, Dave. Well, 25% of eligible voters, so the voting block is 18 to 29 years well, old. Yeah. 25%. A quarter of an entire group like that voting is, is big, and this is actually the second highest youth turnout in midterm election history. And what this suggests for Republicans in particular, because these voters overwhelmingly lean left, progressive, yada, 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 is that the uh, immediate future, at least until these kids grow up and actually have to start paying taxes mm -hmm. and have more skin in the game than just whatever their, you know, ridiculous high school or high school teacher or college professor pumped their brain full of, um, well, when they actually discussed. when they actually have to get in the real world, yeah, I wanted to tack on to David's point about the whole forming young minds in, in school is if you are even remotely concerned with your child learning the crap that these kids are being taught at public indoctrination camps, and if this doesn't tell you exactly what they're you being taught, public schools, yeah, yeah, they know, they um, don't. Uh, if this doesn't tell you exactly the crap that's getting pumped in their head that they would overwhelmingly lean in that direction, I don't know what will. Get your kids the F out of those indoctrination camps. I don't care if you got to put them in private school. Best option would be to homeschool. But this whole idea that, well, older oh, because they won't socialize. Yeah, I know. I don't want them socializing with these psychopaths that, you know, just pump out these mindless drones that just vote in one direction because they don't know anything about the world because they're taught that there's 87,000 different genders and that everybody's entitled to whatever they can squeeze out of somebody else as long as a government program approves it. I don't want my kid learning that. And any society that is even remotely healthy or able to fend for itself isn't going to want a large portion, especially if they're allowed to vote, to uh, to be going in that direction. So listen, Republicans, I know you are kind of think that like libertarians and homeschool parents are kind of weird for wanting to get out of the system. Well, you keep pumping them through that system, you're going to keep winding up with uh, electoral outcomes like this because the younger the kids are, they're not trending in your direction. And that's not by accident because guess who controls the schools? You know it. You see it. You see it through the libs of TikTok count all the time. Who's teaching you these fall kids? fall asleep. You know exactly who's teaching you these kids. You don't reach the youth anymore. So you can't be surprised when they come out and vote overwhelmingly, and not just overwhelmingly to the left, but for the more and more radical policies. So my whole point is that, Dane, how much gender study do you think is happening in China? Not a bit. Russia? Yeah, nope. Our two Not biggest, that those are, you know, paragons of societal our health. Our two biggest competitors in the world right now, mm -hmm. do you think they're caught up with 
whether or not we should have rights for somebody that likes to fuck toasters and doesn't want to be judged for it and wants to cut their hair into a buzz saw. <laughs> and no. However, what I would say identifies is as a two by four. What I would say about that is personally, I could care less about all of that. My problem is that those things are becoming political to the point that, and this is the very Jordan Peterson point, do what you want to do, call yourself what you want to call yourself, but don't toss me in a cage for refusing to, you know, abide by your reality. And that's the problem, right? That's the point. Yeah. You can do whatever you want as long as you're an adult um, and you're not hurting somebody, but don't make me a criminal because I don't agree with it or like sure. it or whatever. That's all I'm saying. Just, but our society is marching It's an appeal to direction. reality. It's an appeal yeah. to ethos. Anyway, last subject that we had on this, and I think it's a little fun, is that Beto O'Rourke and what's her name? Stacey Abrams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not only did they lose again, Again, it's beautiful. It's but so they've hilarious. lost again and again and again. So how many times could, could we have solved world hunger with the amount of contributions to their campaigns? So maybe they should have just saved it, not gone on the dais, and just contributed to the World Health Fund to start feeding everyone in the world. And actually, they might have made a difference in the world other than not getting elected to promote their own clout. Just a thought, a careless thought that crept into my mind. Yeah. I mean, maybe not world hunger because I, I don't think between the two of them, they got $6 billion in campaign donations. But I would say that they could probably have solved U.S. hunger. If we say that U.S. hunger and in, in the terms of problem. in terms of the the global pie of world hunger, I'd say the U.S. is probably a pretty small slice of that pie. Now, which is rather funny, right? Because the ones that were all on Elon's back about six billion dollars to fix the whole world uh, were typically more on the left side of the spectrum, and I dare say that many of them probably donated to the campaigns of Beto O'Rourke and Stacey Abrams to lose, as David said again. And so I got to ask those people, right? About your money where your mouth is. Pay attention to the actions, not just the words. Money's mm. disgusting, Dave. You, really, you don't want it anywhere near your mouth. If you really cared about homelessness and hunger, why aren't you putting your money directly to that? Yeah. You really think Beto getting elected governor of Texas and Abrams of Georgia would have fixed hunger? Forget the country and just their states. You know why I call bullshit on that? Because some of the bluest states that have been under blue control for decades at this point, California, looking at you, have some of the highest poverty and crime rates in the country. So it doesn't seem to me like these blue policies and, and utopia are really solving the, the homelessness and hunger problem. So listen, I, 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 all I got to say is I'm just calling bullshit, okay? I'm calling bullshit on your false concern and your fake virtue and, um, you know... Keep donating to these camps. I hope they keep running because I love nothing more than to see Democratic voters um, or, you know, campaign contributors' money just go up in flames. And they are two of the very best at doing that. The thing is, like, all we're trying to draw a line in this podcast, from what I, from what I can see, is that stop deifying these people. Whatever they run on, they don't mean it. They're placating you. Half of your representatives don't have the IQ that you do. And that's a fact. See Epstein. Fetterman. Fetterman. <laughs> like, see Oz. He's a doctor, but is he really because he's peddling green tea as the fucking fat-burning solution to everybody's problem? Hashtag green tea isn't going to solve your fast food addiction. Sorry. Um, all I'm saying is that this is, it takes, it doesn't take a lot of mind power or brain power or whatever the fuck you want to call it to realize that they don't care about the things they say they care about. All they want you to do is to think that they do so they can get in that place of power and use it for what they want it for is more power to make themselves higher up in the stature to sell away more of your rights so they can gain an iota more 
of a bank account, an iota more of power, an iota more of clout. That's it. That's all this is. And if you keep letting this game play out, nothing's ever going to change. Your life's going to... Excuse me. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. A lot of things are going to change. You're going to start eating bugs. You're going to start being told, well, we can't get eggs this week. By the way, there was a 40% increase in eggs cost this week. I went to the grocery store down here in Florida, and there was an unstocked shelf of eggs for the first time. It's like toilet paper before the pandemic. Like, we can't figure out another protein source other than eggs. How will we ever live without eggs? How will I ever wipe my ass or clean my asshole after shitting other than toilet paper? Other than this faucet that has water and soap that has antibacterial qualities to it? How will I ever be clean after I go to the bathroom? Like, stop following the narrative. That's all we're asking. Just take a step back and really see what's going on. These guys don't care about what you think about them. They ran a stroke patient in an election. They have a stroke patient as president. And all they want is your compliance. I don't want to get you too banned for that. I don't think Biden's had a stroke. He's had brain surgery. That's irrefutable. He has had brain surgery. He has? Yes. Back in, again, don't want to upset my viewers, but yes, he has had brain surgery. Like, again, he can't form a sentence. The leader of our country can't form a sentence without getting lost. They have, you hated Trump for being the teleprompter and then going off the teleprompter, this motherfucker does it every goddamn speech. This guy, like, you guys don't want a democracy. You want compliance if you're a Democrat. So stop saying when you win, it was for democracy because it wasn't. Dane, it looks like you looked something up. You're right. He had brain surgeries for aneurysms. I'm not always wrong. I'm not always the dickhead on this podcast. So what all I'm saying is like, <laughs> we've got two, two mentally compromised people in very high positions. And you think they take your opinion seriously. That's your fault. At the end of the day, that's your fault. Dane, I'll leave the last word to you. Nope, I meant that's it for me. I got nothing. <laughs> Shit, did I do it twice in a row? What? Have the last word. Mm -hmm. Dane. I got a quote for you. Please. Um, so this quote made me think of it when David was talking about, you know, they're not running for you. They're running to aggrandize themselves in their own power. And this is a quote from H.L. Mencken, who was a writer back at the early 20th century. And he said, quote, all men who in any true sense are sentient strive mightily for distinction and power i.e. for the respect and envy of their fellow men, i.e. for the ill-natured admiration of an endless series of miserable and ridiculous bags of rapidly disintegrating amino acids. Why? Now, you could have a lot of answers to that why. Why, do, why is everybody looking for admiration from people who often their admiration is not true heartfelt admiration? And it's just like, oh, wow, look at this person in this high seat. And as, uh, as, as Minkin colorfully put it, that we're all just a bunch of bags of rapidly disintegrating amino acids. I like it. Um, I like it. And what I suggest to you for one of the whys, may not be the only, but I think it's a big one. The why is, it's for them. That's it. It's as far as they think. It's as, that's as far as it goes. It is for them. No matter what you think about it, no matter which of your ideals you've kind of pasted over them, that, you, that you've attached to them, that, that you think that you're voting for them because they love mankind and the other person hates it or whatever the case may be, no. 
No, no, no. You have to disabuse yourself of this political type Santa Claus, Santa Claus belief in, in whatever political reality you think you're living in. They're not doing it for you. They're not doing it for the poor, They're not doing it for the downtrodden. They're not doing it for any of that. They're doing it for the distinction and power that the office brings, whether that be bringing themselves money in the case of Nancy Pelosi, whether that means bringing themselves, you know, just admiration in the sense of uh, Bernie Sanders or something like that. They're doing it for them. That's it. Period. Full stop. Once you pull the scales back from your eyes and realize that whether you're on the right or the left or anything in between, that whoever is doing it, they are running to do it for themselves, then you can vote and see the world with a little bit clearer eyes. Dane, may I parlay onto that? Of course. When you identify more with the senator on the television screen than you do with your neighbor, that's when you know they've won. That's when you know that you're playing the game that Dane was just talking about. Dane, with that cheery note, where can they find this episode? They can find this episode at wmdpodcast.com backslash 120. They can get it on any podcast catcher. They can get the videos on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and Float. They can link up with us on our other socials, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search Weapons of Meme Destruction anywhere you can find us or at WMD Podcast, if it's a, a platform like Twitter that has a handle or TikTok. Um, that's how you can link up with us. Again, as we said at the outset of the show, we're going to repeat again. Most important thing is to join the email list over at that website, wmdpodcast.com, because if we ever get nuked from your favorite platform, you'll find us there. We'll shoot an email out to the email list. They can't take that away from us. Um, but with that we being hope. said, uh, we will see you next week for episode 121. And until then, guys, stay safe, and more importantly, stay free.